the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. So, I'm going to ask you all a question. Do you all know what the word privacy means or keep out? Yeah, sometimes you might want a little bit of privacy. Or sometimes you might be doing something secret like artwork or building Legos that you don't want anyone to bother you. So has anyone ever put a sign on their door that says keep out? Or maybe some people, I know in my house it gets a little bit creative, sometimes they'll put something like sticky on the door so nobody will open it. Has anyone ever done that? You have? Why did you put a sign, two notes on your door to say keep out? Why were you doing inside? You weren't doing anything, you just wanted some privacy. Who was doing something or making something? What were you doing? You were making a sign that no one knew about. And who did you want to stay out? Your parents, all right. Yes, Violet, who, what were you doing inside your room? You were playing with your toys, and you didn't want your sister right behind you to come inside. <laughs> All right, one more. Building Legos. Who'd you want to keep out? Your whole family. All right. <laughs> well, it's interesting, and it's very sad. The Bible begins with humanity doing the wrong thing. We take a wrong step, because Adam and Eve the people that God created to live in the garden in perfect harmony with Him, they disobeyed Him. They disobeyed Him and they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And there was another tree, the tree of eternal life, that once they had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God said if they live forever, they're going to live forever in sin. In sin and decay. So guess what God did? He said, out. He said, go out. It's a very sad day. It's a very, very sad day. And that's how we begin Great Lent a few weeks ago with Adam sitting outside the gates of paradise and saying, it was so beautiful in there and now I'm decaying in this fallen world. But God didn't use tape. He didn't use a sign that said, keep out. You know what he put? He put the cherubim, one of the angels. And what was the cherubim carrying? A flaming sword. That's pretty scary. Like the cherubim doesn't just kind of like stand like this. It spins around. So that that flaming sword, you might think it's over there, but all of a sudden it's over here. And there's no way of getting back in to taste of the tree of life because God didn't want his creation to live eternally sinning he wanted them to live eternally but not eternally sinning and God could have very easily left Adam and Eve to rot and decay outside the gates of paradise but he did something very beautiful something unheard of something that I believe is so unbelievable that it has to be believable. He sent His only begotten Son, the one who sits in glory at His right hand, to come and die on a cross. It's amazing. That's what God did to get Adam and Eve and all of us back. But I want you to think about something. We heard something very beautiful. Not everyone was here in Orthros, but during Orthros, we heard some pretty hymnography about the cross. Typically, before Jesus, the cross was an instrument of torture and death. Like it was a sign of you had not only failed, but you failed miserably. You are a loser. And our God loves us so much that not only did He take the pain of the cross, but he also took the shame of the cross. 
Because to die on the cross meant you had let down your whole family. Anyone associated with you, you had let them down because of the shame that the cross endured. And our good God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said, I'm willing to not only accept the pain of the cross, but also the shame of the cross for the salvation of you your parents, your grandparents, and if you can even think this far ahead of your children and your grandchildren. That's how much Jesus Christ loves you. But I want to ask you a question. So we said that the cross was a symbol of defeat because it was a wooden instrument used to crucify, crucify people on. But now I want to ask you a question. Anyone ever been to a campfire? Some of y'all went to family camp a few, about a month ago. We had a fire there. And whenever the fire started to go down, what did we do? You put more logs on it. So wood does what to the fire? It heats it. It makes it bigger. But in the, in the morning service, the ortho service, we heard something very interesting. Guess what the wood of the cross did to that fiery sword that the cherubim was holding? You would think if there's a fiery sword and you add wood to it, you would think it would make the fire bigger. But because it was the wood of Christ's saving cross and his mercy, it says it quenched. It quenched the flames of the cherubic sword that was keeping people outside of Eden. Because Christ wants us to go back to paradise. Christ wants us to live in eternal life with his Father. But we can't do it the way we had been doing it. And that's why Christ tells his disciples in the gospel today, anyone that wants to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Who was the first person not to deny themselves? Adam and Eve, they were given specific instructions, do not eat of this fruit, have everything else, it's all yours, but don't partake of this fruit. Had they denied themselves, they wouldn't have partaken of the fruit, but they said, we are going to do what we want to do, and because they did that, all of a sudden, the world turned into a chaotic place and sin and death entered the world. And like I said earlier, Christ and God the Father could have said, forget them, forget all of creation, we're happy in heaven. But he said, we want to save humanity. We want to save fallen Adam and his race. And so he did that with a cross. I want to read you something else that was read. Listen how awesome the poetry of the church is. Listen what it says about the cross. Okay, it's so beautiful. It says Pilate, we know who Pontius Pilate was. He was the one that condemned Jesus to death. And who died with Jesus? Remember there were two, two robbers, there were two thieves that died with them. It says Pilate set up three crosses in the place of the skull, that's Golgotha. Two for the thieves and one for the giver of life. Seeing Christ, Hades, that place of the dead, cried to those below. All right, so Hades, if you can think about Hades, the place that held all the dead people, it's kind of like he's a person. And he's crying out. He's crying out to all his guards. He said, oh, my ministers and my powers, who is this that has fixed a nail to my heart? Remember, Christ was crucified to the wood with nails, and now Hades says, Who is this that has fixed a nail to my heart? A wooden spear has pierced me suddenly, and I am torn apart. Inwardly I suffer. Anguish has seized my belly and my senses. My spirit trembles, and I am constrained to cast out Adam and all his descendants. A tree, and this is awesome, a tree brought them to my realm. What's a realm? It's like a place of their a domain, a kingdom. So Hades says, a tree, that tree in the garden, 
has brought them to my realm, but now the tree of the cross brings them back again to paradise. Isn't that awesome? A tree brought them into Hades, but now all of a sudden the tree of the cross, because Christ died upon it, has given them access to the kingdom of heaven. So bada bing, we're done, right? All you have to do is wear a cross, come to church, bow down before the cross, and kiss the cross, and everything's good, right? No, you have to walk in the way of the cross. And this is the difficult thing. It's easy to wear a cross. It's easy to bow down and kiss it. But once we leave here, we have to continue walking in the way of the cross. And guess that what means we have to do? All those people that are mean to us, but they say, could you please forgive me? We have to forgive them. All the people that are mean to us and they don't say forgive me, we have to forgive them. All the grudges that we hold against family members, against people at work, we have to let them go. To live the way of the cross means to live like the man who is God who died upon it and who said, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. It's easy to get a diamond cross. It's easy to bow down and kiss it. But to live like the God who died upon it is much more difficult. But this is what God asks us to do. Not only asks, but commands us to do. And he tells us who are growing older, if you want to do it the right way, look at the kids. Become like children who are dependent on their parents. And know that every good thing will be given if we follow the way of the cross. And it might not be given in this earth. Sick people that are good continue to get sick. Car accidents happen to people who do the right thing. But my brothers and sisters in Christ, we are not concerned with this world. We are concerned with that world which is eternal, where God reigns in His glory. We saw what happens in this world. The King of heaven and earth was crucified on this earth. But when he was risen to power and when he ascended to glory, he now sits at the right hand of the Father. This is the one that we must please. And we please him by acting like him. All the other things, the poles, and when we look in the mirror, those things won't get us salvation. But pleasing the one that died on the cross, this will gain us access to the Father through the Son and in the Holy Spirit. May we, my little children, and my brothers and sisters in Christ, may we bow down before the cross with our legs, with our hands, but most importantly, may we walk in the ways of the cross and live like he who died upon it for the life of the world. To that good God be glory forever and ever. Amen.